let me first introduce you to the moderator vivek bole chairman and managing director neo modern arc vivek is a principal architect of neo modern architects and has successfully completed more than 800 projects and is working on over 500 ongoing projects in india and abroad he has won many prestigious designs design competitions and received more than 60 national and international awards he has also he is also known for his innovative ways of integrating various softwares to achieve unique presentation style and parametric geometrics and achieving sustainability in his projects now our speakers mr sujay gopatkar principal architect opus architects sujay gopatkar is the founder and principal architect at opus architects his designs draw inspiration from philosophies of form based design and cubism the firm's work scores highly on contextual relevance and functionality in 11 years sujay has grown opus architects to a 15 member strong team and has successfully delivered over 100 base build and interior projects across residential commercial industrial academic and hospitality sectors up next suraksha acharya founder and principal architect midori architects suraksha has acquired her masters from school of architecture graduated school london ba from anna university chennai she has practiced under the mentorship of dr ken yang where she was closely involved with this with the design phase of several large scale mixed use residential and commercial tower projects in asia that were driven by sustainable concerns in 2012 she joined a startup from pomri studio in singapore as an architectural design and later pursued her passion for green as a sustainable sustainability consultant with design partner architects in 2013 as a green building analyst with environmental design solutions in 2014 and later in 2015 she established her firm midori architects up next kushbu davda and sija sudakaran founding principals of studio emergence Kushbu did her masters in minimal nets and boundary conditions. Her study of cartographies and maps is critical in the way the studio studies urban context eventually. She was practicing with Adjutim Designs, Sanderson Group and RS Architects prior to studio emergence where she has worked on various prestigious clients like GVK, Inox, Disney, etc. Sita did her research in grid shells which deeply dwells in the theories of architect free auto her thesis was awarded the first place amongst all master design principals in design school that year Sita was working with archetype consultants ZZ architects prior to starting studio emergence and has worked on various high rise projects with Sheth group seasons group etc up next Swapnil S Gawande computational design expert and architect studio draft swapnil specializes in generative design methodologies involving computational techniques and advanced material sciences and technologies investigating the potential they hold within the domain of architecture and urbanism his major interests lie in exploring looped data transitions between digital analog and simulative experimentations of material informed geometrics and re realize them through advanced digital fabrication techniques these initiatives are undertaken in his design collective named studio draft which rigorously implements a research based methodology as an effective strategy to provide novel solutions at different scales requesting all the attendees to please participate in the poll and write the name of the speaker whom you would like to address the question during the q&a session also do subscribe to our youtube channel scs tv wherein we are live now and we, we you can get access to all the webinars and steel construction updates over to you mr vivek bole thank you thank you andre uh, good morning friends since its emergence in late 18th century steel structures are being used for various reasons and purposes till the beginning of 20th century steel structures became popular just because of use in the military purposes we all know how the bold experiments by visionaries created iconic structures like eiffel tower brooklyn bridge uh, sydney harbour bridge 
and so on and so forth. Uh, with the beginning of the computational design or parametric design, the designers have got a whole new architectural vocabulary of concepts and ideas. Today, we are going to witness this paradigm shift in the use of steel by the young visionaries. Uh, I'll start with uh, Sujay. Sujay, can you start your presentation, please? Thanks, Vivek. Uh, morning to all of you. Just trying to share my screen. Give me a second. Yeah, so uh, morning all. This is, uh, well, uh, essentially the whole idea of, uh, you know, using steel is to not just uh, have it as an another structural alternative to uh, concrete, but uh, the whole, I mean, the point behind some of the projects that we do is to actually celebrate steel. So, which is what I've been uh, coining this as for a, for a long time. And what I mean by celebrating uh, steel is to make it visible, to make it um, an integral part of uh, uh, the design, uh, to give it its, uh, you know, position and place that it deserves as a design element. So the project that we are going to talk about today or present to you from Opus uh, essentially is a commercial space that we have done uh, in Bangalore, uh, an area called Kalyan Nagar. Um, well, before we proceed uh, in the introduction, I think something was missed. We are a 15 year old organization and we are about 20 strength now, but anyways, I'll continue with the presentation. Um, just one sec, it seems to be a problem. All right, so this is a building. Uh, it's a very small commercial uh, uh, building in the hub, uh, you know, in a very co commercial hub called Kalyanagar in Bangalore, where there are other contemporary buildings. Uh, when the client initially came to us, they wanted, a, 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 you know, me or us to start, uh, basically look at a very uh, different approach to a commercial building, the typical you know, column structure with a ACP or a glass facade uh, was not something that they were looking out for. Um, I have always uh, wanted and I've always played a lot with steel and steel seems to be my favorite uh, material to go to. I proposed, uh, I mean, I checked with them if they were okay with steel, they seem to be. And this was the first proposal that we gave to them. So essentially, as you see here, it is an uh, uh, exoskeletal diag you know, diagrid our experiment was to, you know, use this as the facade, use this as an elevational element, uh, as an external feature and not hide it behind a, a glass curtain or a, any other kind of a facade and to actually celebrate steel, like I mentioned. So uh, essentially, yeah, this is what a building looks like. You would typically see a diagrid, uh, which is, uh, you know, spans the height of one floor. So this is a five floor structure. There's a basement and then we have five upper floors. Uh, this being, uh, you know, having a light roof on top. Uh, there's a light sloping roof, which slopes inwards. Um, the whole premise of this lied around the fact that we wanted to use experiment with the diagrid and not use a typical column and beam kind of a structure. Um, essentially, uh, Initially, we made the diagrid and uh, later on came up with the concept that why not expose the diagrid, expose the, the structure and hence, uh, you know, give it a very unique uh, feature. This is a shot of uh, the interiors. Uh, interestingly, we had one client uh, who wanted to rent the space who came in into the space and he was looking around and I happened to be there asked him, what are you, what are you looking out for? So he said, I was looking for columns. He said, there are no columns. So I said, no, no, that the, the tubes that you see outside are actually holding the building up. And uh, I still remember the look on his face. And, uh, and I gave him a small lecture about what, what diagrids were and uh, how they worked. So <clears throat> essentially, yeah, so this is an external lattice which acts like an ex exoskeleton. Um, essentially, it means that there is no skeletal framework inside and the skin of the building is uh, what actually holds it up. Uh, we have a lone central column that you saw in the previous uh, image, which essentially, uh, uh, you know, was, was used to reduce the, the beam depth here to reduce the span along the central uh, uh, axis. 
but essentially here the exoskeleton is what is holding up this entire building and if you can see from uh, from this graphic below uh, the the you know the green part is actually the concrete uh, base which is the basement and the core which uh, has a small lift lobby toilets uh, and the staircase so that's made in concrete and uh, the rest of the floor plate is uh, entirely made uh, in steel uh, and uh, of course i mean i'll not dwell into the aspect of how triangles are the the strongest simple element and all of that i think that's quite known at this point in time uh, today's presentation is largely uh, around this particular uh, detail which is uh, the node detail if you see the elevation uh, you know we had to resolve the the junctions of all of these struts or uh, you know uh, uh, tube elements and uh, when initially when we came up with the idea of of the diagrid we quickly realized that uh, you know the the god lied in the details of uh, this particular node so then there were many iterations done uh, uh, many concepts that were evolved as to how we would go ahead and uh, you know design this detail um, although you would just imagine that these are six tubes that come in one place and they are welded together when you actually uh, work out an algorithm of uh, how you would construct this uh, it, it's not so easy so today's pr presentation largely revolves around how we went uh, you know went ahead with the design details these are some of the drawings that were given out of our office uh, some of my initial sketches when we conceptualized how the glazing and this external uh, uh, diagrid as well as the beam structures interfaced and how we would make it waterproof and how uh, you know structurally stable this whole thing would be um i'll quickly go on to some site images which kind of gives you an overlay as to how this was uh, constructed um some of the joints between the beams uh, here this is the joint between the central uh, circular column and the beams across some more here this you see the diagrid under construction uh, two floors here with the beams being overlaid uh this would be the steel roof the inward sloping roof that we have on the upper level now essentially i chose this small project uh, because although it was small there was a lot of um, uh steel elements and uh, like i said uh we have you know used uh, the steel you know as a hero here uh in order to achieve you know the elevation or, or the design that we wanted to here you see how the slab reinforcement has been welded uh to the peripheral uh, uh, i section beams uh this is where the okay and this was a regular uh, we had not used decking for cost purposes to bring that down we had a regular uh, centering uh, uh, me mechanism for the slabs and so basically there are regular concrete slabs which are cast between the uh, beams between the steel beams and then deshuttered so this was another uh, you know uh, element which makes it a composite structure yeah so what i'm going to talk about is essentially these nodes uh, today you see this uh, in the image uh, we had had to use cranes in order to you know uh, put up elements uh, here the the biggest challenge was i wanted uh, these nodes and uh, these tubes or these struts to seamlessly join into each other typically when we see uh, uh, steel construction you see a lot of cleat plates you see a lot of uh, uh, you know plates been welded on top of joints between two elements where the aesthetic of that was uh, uh, that joint would be compromised so the idea here was to take this um, you know detail this joint in such a way that uh, none of those external cleat plates or stiffener plates would be visible and all of that would be concealed which meant that i we had to use a stiffener plate but it had to be inside the tube and not from outside that one simple requirement complicated this uh, entire uh, construction uh, quite a lot and we had to still uh, deliver also because this is a diagrid and it's a very geometric figure if there is let's say at the ground level there is a 1 degree shift in the angle of this el element uh, this would result in a, a 100 to 150 mm uh, you know uh, error at the topmost level or at the terrace level and hence uh, the precision on this build had to be you know uh, uh, 
very precise. So we had to have a lot of precision so that there were no errors geometrically. So it was imperative that these uh, nodes had to be prefabricated uh, in a shop floor with the precise angle uh, and then brought to site and installed at the precise location. So although this is uh, easy to say, uh, but at site there were a huge number of challenges. So here you see that the, <clears throat> there is a pre-fabricated uh, node being installed along with the rest of the tubing. Uh, you see the welders welding and plug welding uh, the various joists and the beams into a node. You see the, uh, the process of plug welding. You can also see plugs uh, here, which are yet to be welded. You see a plug hole here. Um, I'll, I'll uh, detail this uh, junction out. So essentially what happens is, uh, once these junction uh, nodes are put in their place, it is, uh, let's say these three nodes in question, introducing these struts in the middle with just about uh, six mm to eight mm of a, of a gap between the two to uh, for us to fill the weld with was a challenge. So this is like you had to introduce the sleeve from a, uh, uh, it had to have a sleeve inside, but you couldn't, um, how should I say, uh, put the tube onto the sleeve. This, uh, you know, uh, this tube had to go between the two nodes. So this was the detail that we uh, uh, did. It's, this is like a, a quick stop animation that will help you explain. We had the red color here is a sleeve that goes into the strut, which is a blue uh, tube here. This is a prefabricated node that was already there. So how we went about uh, it is I'll show you in this animation. First, the sleeve goes into the tube. What we then do is uh, uh, we we've, we've, uh, slide the tube, so, you know, the sleeve into the tube fully. Then there is this uh, small you know, uh, peg that is welded in place to hold that sleeve in place. Eventually, we uh, also have a stopper peg which is introduced inside the node at that location. So it, it, it is gone there. And then we introduce the tube onto the correct uh, location, aligned it, and then slowly removed this peg. So moment we release this peg uh, with some effort, uh, because uh, we had this uh, slot at an angle, we could force this inner tube down to rest onto the stopper peg that we had. So this way the sleeve got introduced inside the tubing and uh, uh, it became an integral part of the node and the strut. And eventually uh, all the welds, which is the plug weld, you know, the slot here for the plug weld and the tubing joint with an 8 mm uh, fillet were welded. Okay, we had a prefabricated, uh, 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 you know, capping for better aesthetics because we had to have a lot of uh, external welding which we couldn't grind onto this for structural reasons. We had a cap, so this took care of the aesthetic. This was made with a, a five mm uh, sheet, and then this was, uh, uh, you know, superimposed on that particular joint, essentially to then give us a very uh, seamless and, uh, you know. Uh, how should I say, uh, uh, external, uh, a, a very clean joint, if you like, which had a perfect aesthetic. So this is uh, how it ultimately finished. So although it's a very small project, um, uh, and uh, even from a tonnage point of view or a square footage point of view, uh, we are happy that uh, Mr. Devaya, who is a client, gave us an opportunity to play with steel. Also happy that our consultants and uh, uh, you know the contractors. Uh, by the way, this entire thing has been erected by an ordinary fabricator. Uh, we had immense uh, detailing that was done, and these guys are good at what they do. And once they figured one node out, it was a matter of you know repetitive uh, production. And in fact, the detail was made in such a way that it was repetitive. And once they understood the concept, they could go out and uh, uh, erect the rest of the structure, having under understood the fundamentals as to how this had to go in. So in my 10 minutes, I guess this is all I have for you today. And uh, it was nice being here. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Sujay. Wonderful presentation. My compliments. Thank uh, you, sir. Our next presenters, uh, our team, a very young, dynamic team. And I admire their work a lot. I have seen a few of their presentations. Over to you, Kushbu and Sija. Thank you, sir. Please start your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Kushbu. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm Sija. I'm Kushbu and this is Sija. We are from Studio Emergence. And uh, just a little bit of uh, brief about ourselves while we share the screen. 
So we are an architecture and uh, uh, interior design firm, and we are basically parametric consultants also. So um, what we are going to do today is the uh, we are going to introduce a project which is very close to my heart because it's also emergent, and um, uh, we are going to show a very different project which is going to be experimenting with steel. And it's a small scale project; it's an urban installation uh, that's going to happen in Chandigarh. But uh, it's a, a very different take on how steel can actually be used to create uh, objects and um, structures which are uh, which are actually defining how steel can be used. So over to you, Sija. Yeah, uh, so I think yeah, Kushbu's already introduced us. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is how does uh, emergent systems in nature work? So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of emergent systems in nature already, wherein what first we can also, also address the fact that what is emergence, the phenomenon of emergence. Emergence actually is the ability of individual agents interacting closely with, with each other and creating a bigger system in nature. So this, as you can see, the examples that have been already displayed on the slides happens with a lot of biological organisms like ant behavior that people are already aware of, the flocking of birds and the school of fishes. But it also happens with inanimate uh, objects, which is like uh, a sand dune with air that has been actually interacting with the sand dune for a long amount of time and what type of patterns are created. So today what we are going to talk about is one particular such emergent uh, uh, topic, which is murmurations. So what murmurations is, is what is being displayed on the screen, which is the ability of a type of flocking birds, in this case, starlings, which are the Indian miners also in Asia. So uh, these birds actually flock in a particular manner such that these flocking patterns create such a beautiful and drastic system. So these uh, uh, birds, what they do actually, they don't really communicate with the entire herd or the entire flock. They usually only talk to the uh, adjacent birds here. And what happened in 1987 was the first time when actually uh, scientists could uh, understand what are the systemic behavior of these particular birds and algorithms were, behave, were actually uh, developed based on this particular behavioral pattern. So there is a very precise mathematics behind it, which has been actually uh, spoken about very clearly. So one of the things that we can look at is the simple rule set that these particular flocking uh, behavior exhibits which is there are three basic rule sets that you can look at, which is the uh, separation, the alignment, and the cohesion. The separation talks about how one bird is there and it's separated from each other, such that it doesn't actually go and collide with the next bird. In the case of a starling, what happens is that one bird only talks to six birds around it. So that is its actual interaction zone. And all of these birds are doing that together to create this particular systemic behavior that they exhibit at the end of the day, which can be seen here as well. So when we talk about the separation, it only shows at what degree the separation is. The alignment talks about how one bird is aligning to the other to make sure they can actually go as a flock as exhibited in this particular image here. And the cohesion talks about after the alignment change, how the entire flock can move on its own. So here we have actually animated one of the flocks that we were studying of Starling to understand what are the behavioral changes inside and what happens outside as a particular nature of the being as well. One of the things to understand with the flocking behavior is the beauty of it is also that it not just creates these uh, systemic forms, but it also allows the internal birds to rest a bit and the external birds can fight the wind pressure at the same time. So these behavioral patterns are actually to do with a lot uh, to survive in nature and to also understand how group behaviors can exhibit in such a way that one particular pressure on one particular organization has been reduced drastically. So these are some of the things that we look at when we go on to the site here, which is uh, uh, if we can look at the simulation that we had done for the site. Yeah, for sure. Yes, um, so I'll talk about the site a little bit. Uh, so this site is in Chandigarh. It's a chalk called Matka Chalk. It's pretty famous in Chandigarh. And um, uh, it is it is right next to uh, the Taj Hotel and uh, the Chandigarh Housing Board and the Rose Garden. So you can imagine it's a very important chalk. It's in exactly in the crossroads of Janmarg and Madhyamarg. So anyone who is crossing Chandigarh or is entering Chandigarh uh, will definitely pass through this. 
it's one of the biggest shock and it's very prestigious in the mainly because uh, Lee Corbusier had only made uh, one landscape uh, chalk in Chandigarh, which was this. And we have the privilege to actually uh, redesign this uh, after so many years. Add on to it, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this this installation is a reminder for the people of Chandigarh and for uh, other cities as well that these kind of uh, murmurations or these kind of patterns in nature are slowly diminishing when uh, when there's so much climate change happening and so much urbanization happening. So these kind of uh, installation art installation can be a reminder to the city of what it actually has right now and. Uh, how we have to preserve this this uh, a kind of uh, behavior for us to uh, coexist in nature. As you can see over here, what we have tried to do is create like a series of birds in steel, which are uh, origami shaped birds. And we have tried to actually showcase them as really tall flying structures. Now, this was only possible with the help of really lean uh, steel members, which we have used over here. And uh, we have created like a mechanism in which uh, we'll be able to join those pipes to the ground and uh, the bird, birds will appear to be flying around the matka, which is like a, a water member. And uh, we also uh, want, we have a, we have the plan to actually light up the whole uh, uh, installation in night so that uh, it's interactive uh, with the city as well. We created a series of prototypes to understand the scale and uh, the kind of uh, structure we would like to have because of course we were really experimenting with steel to actually its fullest because the slenderness ratio of the pipes were quite, were quite was quite large as well as the birds uh, we wanted them to be as light as possible and as less complex as possible since there are a lot of birds which we are uh, going to fabricate in this case. So here, one of the major challenges that we faced was the wind in on site because it's an open chalk of 100 meters and all the cars were actually going as a vortex around it. So the wind was almost becoming like a vortex point in the center of the matka. So for us, it also made sense to mimic the starlings uh, behavior because the starlings as a whole, what they do because they are so closely packed to each other, they resist wind pressure very beautifully. So that we experimented with a lot of small prototypes, real scale prototypes as can be seen here. And with a series of drawings, we created like a very simple mechanism, uh, which is deduced from a series of experiments, which we did in a uh, real scale in uh, with the real prototypes. And uh, we got this and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you can see that we have created like a very simple mechanism in which you can also remove the birds for maintenance if required. And uh, we did some wind analysis with the help of uh, CFD analysis. And uh, uh, we, of course, derived it a very aerodynamic shape, which uh, actually uh, didn't require a lot of resistance from the wind. Uh, as you can see, the structure is quite large compared to the, the vehicles around. So we wanted the vista to be quite long because uh, the pedestrian entry or the pedestrian movement around the site was quite far from the installation. Uh, you're not quite allowed to go to the uh, actual chalk. So you will be able to see it only from the pavement. So we wanted the installation to be uh, visible from not only the vehicular accesses, but also the pedestrian accesses, which are almost 150 meters from uh, the actual installation. So it, the highest um, level of the birds is almost uh, six meters, which is almost two floors. So. Um, this is yeah this is how the whole structure looks so what we wanted to actually depict with this uh, kind of an installation in uh, urban scale is there is a lot of different ways to actually look at architecture and look at design which is uh, which can be derived from nature which can be a series of experiments which the, the whole process of architects actually creating structures which are um, very um, traditional and method, there are a lot of new things, new techniques which are happening, uh, which actually use uh, robotic fabrication, which actually use a lot of uh, techniques of self-organization, which will not only optimize the material we use, but also the time required for construction. Now, uh, especially um, uh, the way things are going, um, uh, new, newer techniques and newer ad adoption of technologies like parametric design will be the thing of the future. Like, uh, people who are uh, able to adopt these kind of technologies right now will be uh, actually accelerating their practices and their um, projects in, in the near future. 
that's how I would like to wrap up. These are also some of the projects which we use in different scales also. And uh, yeah, th thank you for uh, getting us on board today. Thank you, Kujbu. Thank you, Sijam. It was again, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I do agree that uh, the next future is for parametric digital architecture. Uh, and moving on to our next presentation uh, to Suraksha. Uh, Suraksha, if you can share your screen. Thank you, Vivek. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Suraksha Acharya, founding principal of Midori Architects. Midori is based in Chennai and I started the firm in 2015. And uh, true to its meaning, we believe in evidence-based design approach aided by advanced simulation techniques to produce architectural pleasing work while pushing boundaries of performative integrative design process that enhances our thinking and design making. So today I wanted to showcase one of our award-winning uh, competition projects. Uh, it gave me, it was our way of exploring steel and gave me a big boost in confidence that landed us a couple of projects. Uh, back in 2018, uh, I came across this very interesting architectural competition called Sky Hive Skyscraper Challenge. And given my experience in mixed use towers in Asia, it was right up uh, our comfort zone. Uh, the brief was very simple to design a modern day 21st century skyscraper with new technologies, material program and facade solutions. Um, the Sky Hive is an open architecture competition, ideas competition. And um, this one came with very few restrictions. The participants were free to interpret the brief. And uh, the brief was quite uh, intense, but in terms of programmatic requirements. But um, this, it was mostly, we were free to participate and uh, choose any uh, site uh, in the world. Uh, and this let our creativity run wild. Um, so since it's a skyscraper competition, we did a research and uh, kind of understood what the world's tallest skylines are. And Hong Kong was an easy choice for us, given the fact that it's dotted with 300 odd skyscrapers with New York trailing behind. And uh, this is a view of um, Hong Kong looking into the Hong Kong Island uh, from the mountains. And it works well given our intense programmatic requirements. And we chose a hypothetical site of 130 meters by 80 meters in the Kai Tak area of Kowloon where um, we chose, uh, we decided to base our project here as it is a derelict reclaimed area that was envisioned to be redeveloped. Uh, a little bit about the history of this area. In the early years, it was used as a military airfield, but after the World War II, it, because of the demands of increase um, for airport runway, um, uh, a new runway was built that jutted into the Victoria Harbor. And um, it, it earned the name of a Kai Tak heart attack because of the hair raising descents of the aircrafts. But later on, uh, it got uh, uh, relocated um, the international airport into Kowloon City. And uh, this area was envisioned to be redeveloped into a distinguished, vibrant, attractive, people-oriented, sustainable neighborhood. And uh, here you can see there are a lot of green spaces already existing around. And here we have a uh, cruise terminal, which we had to take into consideration. And uh, the main thing was the pollution in Hong Kong and availability of private passenger vehicles only uh, made sense that it was switched to more of a hybrid and electric vehicle sort of a philosophy. And as a step further, the emissions at sea levels get easily blown into the dense uh, uh, populated areas into the city. And so uh, the cruise ships that came there, it was important that they switch their fuel at birth. Um, some other effective ways of dealing with Street Canyon um, uh, was to reduce the tailpipe emissions. And that's something that we took into consideration uh, given the transportation of that area is something that we studied. Uh, here is just the uh, site and its views around. You have the mountains uh, on, at the back and uh, views to Victoria Harbor and Hong Kong Island in the front. So here we're looking at the site and the skyline from Victoria Harbor and you can see it's surrounded by mountains and water studded with apartment blocks. And that's our project over there. 
uh, it's called titled Aerohive. And uh, the real premise behind uh, this uh, challenge was um, that we wanted to uh, challenge the common belief that contemporary tall buildings cannot be naturally ventilated due to their height and offers a pause from that hermetically sealed glass boxes, um, really trying to make it serve as a model of sustainability. So here it really starts with how do we get that natural ventilation into your uh, commercial building and we have to do a deep understanding of the climate. So Hong Kong's climate is subtropical but for half of the year it's uh, with average yearly temperatures of 18 degrees to 25 degrees Celsius and with summer mean time daytime temperatures touching up about 32 and in winter the strong cold winds are generated from the north. Uh, to Hong Kong um, and uh, the wind reverses its direction and brings in the warm and humid air from the south um, in the other part uh, of, uh, of the year. So by carefully incorporating the natural wind patterns of the site, uh, the building is designed to accommodate changing wind conditions and Aerohive uses wind scooping for its air intake with the help of its hexagonal arms that function as wing walls and allows um, that air to exit through operational windows um, and adjacent atria. So during the day, the southeast cool sea breeze blow and in the evening, the cool northerly winds come down the forested slopes and wash across the building. And these environmental factors and structural concepts were really crucial in the shaping of the farm uh, and the skin of this tower. So a little background on how we arrived at the tower form. Uh, in wind climates like Hong Kong, it's very directional extreme winds. And so building shapes uh, that are directionally sensitive are more effective than traditional shape buildings. So this is your uh, point block where um, we really considered aerodynamic dynamic architectural design, uh, taking into consideration its orientation form and position. So we looked at the different uh, shapes and wind effects on different geometric shapes, such as circular, square, triangle, and hexagon. And we use computational fluid design, uh, um, F CFD simulation software to sort of understand the plan variations. And though the cylinder uh, is useful to minimize heat losses and gains through the surface of a building, and its compact shape is desirable, the results show that the circular shape had the lowest wind pressure coefficient. And uh, we wanted to make a unique optimization link between aerodynamic and packing efficiency. While the sphere, uh, which is nothing but your cylinder, will have a great uh, aerodynamic efficiency, its packing efficiency would result in a huge lot loss of space. Um, so we ended up uh, going in for the hexagon. Uh, and the good thing about the hexagonal shape is that it had low values of drag and lift uh, compared to the circular. And it also had facets, which helped drive those natural currents to enhance that air volume exchange and pressure dif differentials between the upwind and downwind, which is your windward and leeward sides of the building. Um, what's also very important that the core, uh, we didn't want it to become extremely dark like most point uh, uh, without any daylight. And so we wanted to keep the flow plate width as minimum. So we kept it at 15 meters um, uh, and we had a core tube structure of steel at the center, which was hollow. And this core tube frame structure uh, rise around, uh, raised about two, eight, 290 meters above the ground level carrying the form and zoning was done uh, like I said, to keep a shallow flow plate. And also uh, the building had been optimized such that the sun will be carefully controlled uh, to bring in the diffuse lighting while uh, avoiding the direct heat gain. Uh, one segment of the hexagon was fragmented to allow the core to be daylit and uh, which is always an issue. Uh, that we wanted to take care of early on in the design process and progressive fractalization of the hexagonal flow plates. Um, each three-story semi-enclosed atrium contains office spaces on either sides of the hexagonal framing arms, uh, which helped in framing that visual communication, bringing people together. And there are numerous studies out there that say workplaces shows an increase in productivity if you're spaces have a lot of light and wind, uh, uh, light um, greenery and offers this to employees. Is that something that we wanted to take into consideration early on? So apart from fragmentation, we looked into aerodynamic modifications of the design approach against wind excitation, like tapering, varying cross sections, uh, farm and plan. And the intention was really to explore the, the facilitation of the air movement with respect to the final farm and the feasibility of the ventilation techniques used in those atriums that would eventually deliver it to indoors. So simulation CFD 
was used to optimize the tower. And um, uh, the, these were run based on uh, 10 year weather data prevailing wind directions in Hong Kong, which was east and southeast uh, for about 500 iterations. And the optimum or, op, 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 operation efficiencies of building form should really be shaped uh, and uh, in a way in which you can maximize the sun control. So we looked at insulation and uh, we wanted to sort of twist um, and see what happens to the solar radiation insulation analysis. And so we look from uh, um, uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise from 45 to 180 degrees and a series of shading insulation studies conducted show that 90 uh, degrees clockwise and um, 90, 90 degrees anti-clockwise gave us yielded the best shading benefit. And so we had to think about the programmatic requirements and the site demanded a, a lot more space. And so we needed to add another tower in there and that helped with mutual shading. Uh, one was rotated clockwise, the other one anti-clockwise and um, also had to look at the ec economics of scale. And so uh, while this tapered farm had retail priority, we had to look at penthouse uh, priority and the maximum economical benefit came with a shape that did flared out and got sort of scaled in the center to become a bit skinny. But then there were issues with overshadowing effects of effects of daylight. So in the center, you saw that there were many, uh, we found out that the daylight was just not reaching the flow plate, which is again an issue because we want to reduce that artificial lighting. And so key to these forms of adaptation is the relationship of the building to the environment and the contextual forces that shape the farm development and environmental behavior. So finally, in order to allow this you know, daylight to penetrate through at all uh, solar geometrical positions, we sort of flipped the tower 180 degrees and rotated it at, at, uh, to uh, 90 degrees to get that access to daylight without obstruction. These are the final solar insulation mapping studies where we do this rigorous studying to understand whether the final form is actually working. And we use this mapping to uh, help us with, uh, you know, uh, determining how the glazing would um, uh, work on the facade, which we'll come to later. So we did use this grid data and the towers A and B are positioned such a way that they mutually shade each other at different times of the year. This is just a computational fluid dynamics showing how what happens to these vertical uh, atrium, uh, uh, sort of the green lungs of this building and how uh, the wind affects uh, around it and what it does in terms of accelerating wind speeds. Um, we also assume simulation results show that the modifications have potential to resist lateral loads and the wind pressure differential differentials are seen in this pressure mapping helps to drive that natural ventilation through that sky atriums to into the building. So here we have a view uh, looking into a particular portion of the building. Uh, this triangulated structural geometry, it's nothing but an exoskeleton with a base height of one is to four um, flows extend across the facade's exoskeleton and the farm is encapsulated by this um, triangulation, uh, triangulated exoskeleton that articulates a multi-story atrium at the extremities, leaving the middle of the flow plate clear, which is what we wanted for functional distribution. And uh, you can very see uh, through this view very clearly there are turning green uh, diaphragms um, that uh, help to capture that directional winds and prevailing uh, breezes and uh, kind of bring them through. So here we have a video um, which I just wanted to play on the algorithm, algorithmic uh, process of design that has been followed in creating sort of a differential array of hexagonal flow plates and the variable scale that changes based on environmental criteria. Um, uh, here we have uh, used this technology to our advantage to sort of uh, work out really in the early stages uh, how the farm would work. Um, we have done um, uh, uh, we have uh, the flow plate distribution here, along with the um, solar mapping, which we used as a, uh, with a, attraction nodes um, and the grid insulation grid data to find out how to place the panels. Uh, we have uh, proposed about 70% kinetic panels and 30% static panels, and in a way in which uh, the glazing percentage would be uh, around 40%. And uh, when the watt hour would rise uh, more than 2,500, for example, the triangle base to height ratio decreases. And uh, if it was between 1,000 to 1,500, the triangle base uh, to height ratio averages. And this is why you see the triangulation increases and decreases based on the solar insulation. And there's uh, the, the, the steel structure is really a tubular one. 
um, and it's, uh, it's cladded with composite aluminum panels. Sometimes they're doubly curved uh, and that's pretty much uh, the uh, final form that we have come. And the form actually bridges at certain areas uh, to create that uh, for the uh, uh, communication between people. This is a, uh, visualize, a visualization of uh, the final form. I can see those green uh, lungs that really help this building breathe. And that's really what we uh, set out to do to kind of see if it's possible to uh, not have buildings that are a, a sort of a sealed box, but are, if, if occupants could actually open the windows and, and if this could happen uh, in a way in which um, uh, the, uh, the uh, based on the CO2 levels uh, and sensors that we install indoors. So here you see a central core that creates an amorph amorphous folding form. And um, uh, you can see that the towers have uh, two different directions based on the climatic aspects. And when natural ventilation cannot be applied in, due to some extreme weather conditions, then the mechanical systems kick in and the sky gardens always remain naturally ventilated. And it's a great place uh, uh, when, uh, for, for all of uh, the occupants of the building. This is another uh, view uh, from the top. And um, uh, the flared roof line at the architectural top is really designed to address the sky park, which is a public green observatory of a sort and could ex it would address that heat island uh, effect um, and also helps to create a natural habitat while filtering pollutants and reducing the COT content um, and uh, while satisfying the aesthetics of the roof. Uh, it had won the competition which was uh, fantastic and we were extremely excited and also um, other competitions like the A Design Award and was well published and um, the jury comments were really about how it uh, Aerohive shows to be a great potential uh, to become a beacon of sustainable design, which is, we were very happy because that's what we really set out to do. And um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, many young architectural practices would agree the merits of entering competitions and not only to get practice, but also this is our way of showcasing our skyscraper design skills and uh, hopefully we get to build one today. With that, uh, I think that's the end. So thank you. Thank you, Suraksha. This was one of the boldest experiment I have uh, seen from any Indian architect in recent times. So uh, moving on to our uh, next presenter, uh, Swapnil. Uh, hello, sir. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah. I start sharing my screen right now. Yeah, please. Are you able to see the screen, please? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Swapnil Gavande, and I represent the Studio for Design and Research in Advanced Architecture, Fabrication, and Technology, abbreviated as Studio Draft. Today, uh, I'll be deliberating on paradigm shifts in architectural morphologies of highway infrastructures. Like all architectural practices, we too have our own share of built and unbuilt projects. But today I'll be discussing one of our highly appreciated projects, built projects, which is the toll plaza on Eastern Peripheral Expressway. India is witnessing a tremendous growth in its public infrastructure in recent times. And a mammoth share of this development consists of uh, national highways that are connecting the lengths and breadths of the country. Recent additions to this network are the Eastern and Western Peripheral Expressways. Together, they form the largest ring road around Delhi and are subjected to maximum vehicular traffic. Hence, when we were approached to design a toll plaza for this expressway, we set out a design brief which will uh, not only make the structure iconic, but will also accentuate the brand identities of the stakeholders. Now, highway infrastructure comprises of elements which are uh, products of sophisticated engineering processes. The rigid set of parameters of conventional planning within this typology dictates the typical placement of the to and fro lanes and placing the administrative and allied buildings on either side of the highway. Tubular steel columns are placed on these islands and a typical space frame structure covered with pre-coated sheets adorns the top. This typical strategy probably has been prevalent because of the ease of availability of uh, regular space frame structures and PV structures directly from established vendors and the comparative ease in its uh, execution we observed that this strategy may have certain advantages at a micro level, but at a macro scale, they tend to manifest several important issues. 
one of the major disadvantage is that all these structures looks almost the same we observed uh, that this typology as a whole is uh, associated with certain preconceived notions of forms and since many years now it has not evolved over a period of time at all our clients for this project also endorsed this sentiment in such situations professor david billington's words always guide us to achieve a balance between efficiency economy and elegance here we found a perfect opportunity to intervene and propose a design solution that others to engineering standards but also follows a completely different language of structure and aesthetic we started off by sliding the islands towards the edges and making adequate space between the two and fro lanes to accommodate the programmatic requirements the administrative building and its allied facilities were positioned in the central block which again is flanked by the long span roof structures on both sides to cover the toll booths beneath after the efficient placement of the design program uh, we used our design skill sets to sculpt the geometry of the overall structure by fluidly blending the central tower with the wings and uh, this step later helped us to create a unique fusion of function form and performance this is an interesting step of the entire design trajectory where the form was subjected to a series of uh, generative design methodologies using several algorithms and a successful iterations of the skeletal framework which you could see over here were generated by working on several parameters like uh, stress flow analysis displacement load transfer materiality fabrication strategies to name a few the structure in its entirety was an outcome of a rigorous parametric approach this is the digital image of the final built form to be made completely out of steel now an iconic and avant garde structure like this gives a sense of identity to the place and also acts like a catalyst of change making the entire infrastructure as an urban fringe artifact it creates a, an ephemeral interest in the mind of the user during the long monotonous journey on the highway and also changes the identity of a structure like toll plaza the entire structure is designed as one big steel shell with a central core and two large wings on either side the facade of the central core is predominantly a variably triangulated exoskeleton that takes the entire load of the main building and allows the complete structure to stand just on four main columns the curvaceous wings are subdivided into variably hyperbolic paraboloid components which assure ease in load transfer here you can see the total length and width of the toll plaza complex with all its 18 lanes and a quarter of a kilometer landscape medians on either side this is the vertical programmatic distribution of the functions wherein the floor to floor heights are of 6 meters the first floor consists majorly of the control rooms and the officers cabin with its allied facilities <clears throat> the second floor is dedicated to the highway traffic management systems department and training facilities the third floor acts as a recreational zone for the staff <clears throat> and an additional smaller core is provided in the center for the vertical connections and services there are two tunnels below the road level the bigger tunnel acts as a digital art gallery wherein the ar vr models of the structures on the expressway are displayed of course including that of the toll plaza the second smaller tunnel that you can see below the road in the section is for the private movement of the toll booth operators from the respective toll booths to the cashier rooms the central block stands only on four main columns whose pile foundations go 35 meters deep that's 35 meters deep below the ground level After setting up the final design program, we rerun the simulations to check for stresses and displacements. This also helped us to achieve a balance between the slenderness of the structural members and the component scale to that of the structure at a global scale. Once the final member sizing was decided, we generated around 2000 GFC drawings detailing out each and every component and joint. apart from that we also generated a good amount of pile to factory drawings to manufacture the special joineries some quick facts about the structure this toll plaza is 47 meters tall and 115 meters wide and consumes around 750 tons of steel
This brings us to my favorite phase of the project, which is the construction phase, wherein the design leaps out of the computer screen and starts manifesting itself physically on site. For projects like these, steel is a go-to material. We were able to fabricate all the floors off-site and pick and place them precisely <clears throat> at their specific locations with the help of heavy-duty cranes, of course, with a certain set of challenges. By the way, the span of the arch that you see here is 30 meters. At any given point of time, we had a mix of six to eight crawler or hydraulic cranes and hydras moving around the structure, either helping in the assembly of heavy components or at times acting as inverse scaffolding. Sorry. Here you can get uh, the idea of the scale of the project. If you're able to identify a guy doing his job on the wings assembly. To make the structure lightweight, the central core was covered with solid polycarbonate sheets and the wings were covered with tensile membranes. With the use of drone mapping, we were able to keep a tab on the symmetry of the structure by ruling out any discrepancies in the assembly process. Every site has its own set of climatic conditions and this site was no different. Since the site was located in the plains of Haryana, we faced constant dusty winds flowing at high speed, almost like a sandstorm every other day. All the brave hearts of our team working at heights came down during such situations and went up again with the storms abated. That's me on the site with a 42 meter long A-shaped column in the background, picked up by cranes ready to be assembled at its precise location. This is what happens when the architect is both the designer and the builder of the structure. Uh, now that's an architect's favorite, a mandatory black and white photograph of the structure after completion, highlighting the network of straight lines culminating into fluid form. As a part of the process, it was interesting to see how the structure actually appears uh, when someone looks at it from the car. These are certain videos that were recorded during the construction phase of the project. Uh, this is after the completion and business as usual on any pleasant evening at the toll plaza. This is a team of site engineers happily accompanying the drone guy together bird's eye view of the toll plaza. Here you can see the entire expanse of the toll plaza and how it uh, stands right in the center of the expressway. It was a moment of pride for us when on 27th May 2018, the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, inaugurated the Eastern Peripheral Expressway on this toll plaza itself. Looking back in retrospect, I feel that this iconic structure manifests the newly acquired zeal, aggression, and dynamism of our contemporary Indian society. Metaphorically, it could be compared to a falcon standing in its full glory with its heads up high and wings wide open, ready to embrace the new challenges and opportunities of an emerging India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sopnil. Uh, I saw you flexing your wings in the last. So uh, I'll, I'll share a small much. story with you here. Uh, I was discussing about parametric with my friend, uh, JP Agarwal, very dear friend of mine. Yeah. He said, why you need to do this? You don't do it yourself. You appoint Sopnil Gaon. So I said, who is he? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really big compliment for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we have a Thank lot of questions much. here. Uh, we are moving to uh, the basics first. So we all know Eiffel Tower uh, by its uh, creator, Alexander Eiffel. Although he was civil engineer and architect, but he was actually the contractor of the project. And uh, the structural engineer, Morris and Emily and architect Stephen, they never get, uh, got the proper attention. So I always believe that the originate, uh, originator of the idea and the one who implements it and converts it uh, into reality uh, plays most important role in the steel architecture. So my question uh, here is to Sopnil, uh, 
okay. because you are both you are uh, architect designer as well as a contractor if i'm not wrong yeah uh, true so what is your say on this uh, that's a really interesting question sir thank you very much for uh, this question what i would like to say here is that uh, performing a dual role of an architect as well as the maker of a structure comes with its own set of responsibilities and like every other thing it has got its pros and cons the pros are that you are in complete control of the project now there are no discrepancies and no changes or amendments in the structure when you are not there on site which happens to most of the architects who design complicated structures that there are certain decisions which are abruptly taken by the client and the contractor together and the design changes being an architect our visits to the sites are very restricted because we are dealing with multiple consultancy projects at the same time but when uh, a person my, like me is performing this dual roles uh, the cons are that you can't uh, actually work on a lot of projects at a given time because uh, your responsibilities are manifold and you also have to dedicate yourself for a more amount of time on site so of course there's a pleasure of getting your uh, you know seeing your project materialize and manifest itself on site in front of your eyes um, you have complete control over the project you end up doing a lot of allied uh, activities like uh, man and machine management uh, funds management to be very precise and of course construction management um, and yeah you can't be on multiple sites at one time so that's one of the cons so for a practice like us uh, it's very uh, good in a way because we enjoy working on uh, selected projects at any given time we we don't indulge in uh, taking all kinds of projects so so that's a small luxury that we get right very good um, actually if you uh, have uh, heard about uh, or in fact uh, read about uh, franco gary yes. and his career uh, till his uh, 50th uh, year Uh, he was just doing commercial architecture yes. and we know him for his iconic architecture and after he founded uh, that giri technologies and started mm-hmm. taking fabrication jobs right and uh, now in la- last 25 years we know every iconic structure across the world there is somewhere that giri technologies and franco giri is there yes. so i think there is a very close relationship between steel structure parametric and construction so definitely uh, when if we see uh, in the past history the big contractors and the big structural engineers they got more important projects in steel industry right. uh khushbu and sija i've seen your work as i said before uh, i've seen your presentation for uh, that steel exoskeleton for metro station uh, today your presentation was totally onto different flavor of design and that particle simulation and use of uh, use in landscape is very innovative idea we can use steel and parametric in many other fields i believe in every uh, uh, artistic expression you can use steel and uh, parametric so how you use this combination in interior sculpture or any other form of design uh, so yeah kuch yeah. bhi Okay, uh, so yeah, we we do use uh, steel and uh, actually uh, fabrication, all kinds of fabrication, uh, mostly parametrics in uh, interior design also. Uh, we actually explore the forms in a way that uh, uh, it actually you know um, uh, experiments and actually takes the material to to its limit. So steel actually uh, is a very interesting material for us. We have also used it for a lot of urban scale projects, like urban design projects. and interior design is of course we are experimenting a lot and uh, creating uh, these uh, various installations in interiors so i think, I think one of the uh, first uh, sorry so one of the presentation that we given so one was metro and one with ssmb we done the presentation name itself was uh, macro to micro so what we done we shown different scales where we had used it one was an interior design project where we made we made a series of arches the other was an urban design the other was metro and one facade as well So today, because of the time discrepancy, we had to be sure that we are small. <laughs> so, but uh, there are really different scales that we work with when it comes to steel because it's so malleable that we have fun with it. Uh, certainly, I would like to see that presentation someday. Uh, sure. Anybody else has tried this unique combination of steel and parametric, other than architecture? Uh, Sujay or uh, Sopnil Suraksha? Uh, yes, uh, we. 
uh, not just work in uh, toll plazas as uh, most of the times we are labeled as we also worked on a lot of other projects like urban furniture uh, urban infrastructure projects uh, recently we also completed uh, uh, the Maharshi Karve statue project in Pune, uh, which was a parametrically generated canopy made completely out of steel. And this was done in collaboration with the college that I'm associated with. I teach at the, uh, the Department of Digital Architecture at Dr. B in College of Architecture in Pune. So we came up with that project. We have also did, uh, designed and executed the largest parametric bench in India, a 30 feet long parametric bench. I haven't published it yet. Maybe you all will be able to see it soon in some days. So we also do these kind of projects. Very good. And uh, Sujay, you are specialized into industrial structures. Yes, so uh, do, uh, do you execute yourself or, uh, into turnkey or you, you are not yet started? If you are not started anyway, you will have to start it eventually. <laughs> uh, happy to say uh, we've started about five years ago. It's a different entity where my wife, who's now sitting next to me, is my partner. Uh, it's called Vitana Projects. So we do design, manage, and build. Uh, so we are doing industrial uh, buildings. Um, also, uh, regarding parametrics, we are currently working on a large assembly, uh, you know, space for a religious, uh, uh, you know, function, uh, where we are trying to congregate more than 5000 people. So it's, it's just a concept st stage, uh, stage right now, maybe one day I'll present that pro project too. And um, if I get to execute it, nothing like it. <laughs> we can collaborate. I'm always open. <laughs> always. That was quick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See, he's a hardcore contractor. He started. Contractor. Uh, Suraksha, yeah. uh, this was, I said, uh, boldest experiment. But if you see, most of the Hong Kong buildings are modern. Okay, not exactly ultra modern. They are modern, very modern, but not ultra modern. The same design would have been more acceptable by your client if it were in Dubai. Okay, because Dubai has got acceptance for almost anything which is uh, not done before. Right. Okay, so sure. if you can uh, explain how to convince your client to accept this kind of design. Now, I know the, this was a competition entry, but suppose you do it for your client here in India, uh, you'll have to actually, uh, you all of this question is for all of you. How to convince your client to accept this kind of parametric design? People look at it like it's an alien architecture, you know? And uh, the questions what we get most of the time, very basic questions, which software you use, and then uh, how, how the client uh, reacted to this. So uh, I would like uh, you to explain yeah. how to convince your client. This is a very tough question you're putting to me, <laughs> but uh, I absolutely agree with you. I think the nice thing about parametric design and the software out there right now is that very early on in this, design stages, we can rule out a lot of options that won't work. So we, and we can do it very quickly. And the time that you save is, I think, the most valuable thing in this process, if you can kind of master the software. And um, so what I would say is that um, even with a hospitality project that we're doing in Chennai, we have a curved shell structure where the starter for the form work was really by using steel. So we use steel rebars that we bent and then we placed it on the template. And then from there, the form work was sort of uh, uh, brought, to, brought to life. So steel was used in, in that sort of a way. And we- uh, uh, Acceptable. We can yeah. use steel in many, many innovative ways. The softwares are now very uh, yeah. innovative. Then they help yeah. us a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm doing parametric myself a lot, but the basic question is always, how to convince your client. Yeah, so that's what I was coming to. So for this client, it was a very, he wanted something different, but of course cost is always the first thing that comes to their mind. So very early on, we were able to show them all of the things that won't work. And then you have to kind of give them a calculation of where it ends. So, so how much does this cost? How much steel would be used very quickly? Kind of come, up, come down to numbers. So then it, they don't look at it at this, as this really large, difficult feat to get, but they look at it in numbers and that sort of convinces them a little bit. But you're right, it should be in Dubai. It was based in Dubai, this competition, but if Zaha Hadid and all of these other architects out there are doing it and are still, do, I don't see why Indian architects can't get to that point or start building this way 
uh, uh, within our own country. And I feel like if we put these ideas out there it, and uh, the, the society might look at it differently and we may change to that. And I feel the world is progressing that way because we all go uh, abroad and come back. So, for, uh, for great architecture, we require great clients. And the first is how to convince the client. So you give a very right answer that you have to justify with the figures. Right. Okay. If you show him his benefit, he'll accept. And I think this uh, this uh, underlying statement uh, will uh, Suja and Sopnil both will agree because they know exactly how to convince the client. Okay. So I would <laughs> like to hear from them how to do it. Um, I'll go first. Uh, essentially, I think yes. Uh, when this project came about, although it was a very small project in terms of its size, I think the largest challenge. Um, was lightly, as you rightly put it, uh, as to how would you sell this? Now, this was my first concept when I came up. I was skeptical because I, I didn't know if, you know, he, he would bite into steel, uh, literally. So, <laughs> um, I, I think it started by, like uh, uh, Suraksha said, it's, uh, you know, it was about numbers. And also one key important factor I, I it, you know, kind of uh, helped us was time. See, uh, one thing you can achieve uh, is a better a time schedule if you know what you're doing with steel okay uh, of course if you're building something very iconic where you know you're trying new uh, you know breaking the boundaries there could be a this one but if you break it down into a modular device which is what we did and uh, so the uh, exoskeleton i mean the skeletal came up quite soon so the time factor also mattered that was some uh, something that we could use to leverage uh, a sale in this uh, i think we had to uh, we are also into contracting in that sense. So numbers come to us a lot easily. Uh, to put a number on it was was the biggest challenge. And once the time and cost coefficient were introduced, and say, you know that's what started to make this look viable. Right. And then there is a ever looming question of rust. Yes. For that you need another uh, webinar. Yes, yes. <laughs> there are many technical questions being asked here. What kind of steel is being used? What are the softwares? I think uh, there are a few very, very basic questions. We all know, I know, we all know which, what kind of steel your structure engineer will suggest for what kind of structure, depending upon the structure. So, uh, Sopnil, uh, can you yeah. quickly uh, tell yes. us exactly yes. how to convince your client? Yeah, uh, we talked about all the things. We talked about cost, we talked about time. Uh, for me, it is also important uh, to understand the makeability. Uh, it's also the makeability which the client actually demands for because uh, all the clients are well traveled nowadays all of them uh, know what dubai is as you mentioned they know that these kind of structures are made we live in an era wherein with the uh, help of these uh, modern computational tools we can actually design anything on screen but the most important thing for me as a practicing architect as a contractor as a maker as well as as an academician is that uh, how does it goes from the screen out onto the site. That's one very important question where most of the people uh, uh, don't have answers. Or let's say they have answers, but the answers are not enough convincing. So it's very important to demonstrate the makeability of these kind of geometries. And once we do that, fortunately, our practice is doing it. Once we are able to do that, uh, it, it invokes a confidence into the client's psyche that, yes, these kind of structures could be made. And uh, of course, it was difficult for us initially, but we. Uh, hmm, in the initial phase, we uh, took a lot of extra effort uh, in making mock see, models, see, scale I, I'll models. make it a little simpler for you. Uh, mm -hmm. We have now, uh, very less time here. You, you have to convince your government client. That is the most difficult subject. Okay. So you give me in three sentences or even one sentence how you did it. <laughs> uh, in my case, unfortunately, in this case, it was pretty easy. Uh, once uh, we since we were approached by the client, and not, it was not the vice versa. So it was pretty easy because they already had a background check on us and they knew that this would be- Who, who, who put you onto this young, uh, young uh, panel, uh, this thing? You are being approached by the client for doing experiments, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. I was just uh, lucky for that project. But yeah, <laughs> yeah we do face a lot lucky. of, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Kushbu, quickly, if you can answer this. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, so actually, it's it's just educating the client about the advantages. 
and uh, they they are uh, nowadays these clans are very well educated in terms of ad adoption of technology uh, 10 years ago it was bim now it's parametrics the early adopters will be the uh, will be the players who get the first players advantage so i think uh, it's it's as simple as that okay now uh, being designers uh, we get carried away with the software the medium we use for designing you know either the material or the software so how do you control yourself that is very important because see what happens i have seen most of the time when the designers get hang to one software a normal residential building they put into parametric right. and then right. it doesn't really work out you know so mm -hmm. you need to know exactly where to use which particular tool so uh, do you have such situation kushbu and sijal do you have such situation where you got carried away and you realized your mistake and what are those mistakes we want to learn from your mistakes yeah that's a lot of, yeah it's always the there are a lot of mistakes we make around the way but uh, one of the things that we really practice is we do not really think of the softwares that we use as parametric softwares they also do general uh, uh, drafting and all the other things as well so we don't do these cross disciplinary things of going to cat for something and this for this see so, because i am i am doing myself parametric correct, a lot correct. and then it it becomes really very difficult to bound yourself within the limits you know correct understanding correct. your own limitation while designing so what not to do coming mistakes for sure so i want to learn from your mistakes i don't want to so uh, <laughs> okay okay go ahead yeah yeah i understand no so so it's firstly to know what the client wants so many a times you know like uh, most of the clients that approach us or we have been approaching because we have been one of the first disruptors who've been really talking about parametric we've been doing this continuously in the last five years so most of the people who we talk to and educate they already kind of think that they want this thing they wouldn't want the entire building to be changing like even today all our residential high rises which are around the range of 70 to 110 meters none of them are steel completely because nobody is ready to do that they want it to be concrete so the place that we kind of uh, hold ourselves back is the planning we try to do simulation with planning like the entire redevelopment building in fact you were there in one of the client meetings that we did that with so <laughs> after like 6 months of it we had to rein ourselves back because it wasn't working out so when it comes to planning we kind of don't go there we do it ourselves especially with redevelopment projects but uh, when it comes to elevation treatment when it comes to chajja we've been really like you know convincing okay. the clients to uh, quickly uh, transferring this to question to others yeah Uh, anybody made mistake in selection of the material and uh, the softwares and then we realize that and then we rectify when when it comes to clients i don't generally tell them too much about how we do it but i just give them a good visual representation of the basic concept without complicating it and i think how we get there i don't think they really care about but what is the end product and where is the value for their money is what they really look at so i really only because the attention span is pretty short so i kind of like get to the point so with that i i come to a conclusion we architect don't accept that we made mistakes okay let's <laughs> let's move it Uh, I'd like to add a bit on this sir uh, it's actually uh, knowing where to stop in this entire process you know uh, there are so many uh, things that are disposal in terms of computation parametrics it's really important for architects and budding architects especially to know where to stop uh, we should always uh, focus on the design design is still the king whether you use a pencil or a mouse to do it you are equally stupid as the person who is holding it so it really depends upon how you use your how a person uses his or her brains uh, you know for doing all these things at times we do a lot of simulations but these simulations don't actually work out on the actual uh, uh, site and it doesn't work so it's that's one of the mistakes that you know you shouldn't overdo it so yes, that one that's should one not overdo it straight yeah i agree there should uh, be a limit uh, to it uh, there are uh, few fast fire questions sujay uh, what was the floor plate of your building floor plate area Yep, per uh, per floor, two thousand square feet per plate. And the uh, steel grade. Come again. Steel grade, grade of the steel. Ah, uh, this was this was Tata tubes basically. Uh, these were ah uh, uh, two fifty grade. They were two fifty grade. Yeah, I love to check. Yeah, two fifty. Any special type of building? No, not really. Uh, Suraksha. Uh, people are asking which software you used for uh, that simulation wind simulation 
So we yeah, have, because uh, wind tunneling I also. I know <laughs> wind tunneling is not possible for competition project, but certainly that simulation in some software. Yeah, so, so we use Rhino Grasshopper. There's a lot of suites which are open source. Uh, so you can download the suite like Ladybug, et cetera, to uh, you know, uh, do the full uh, analysis, including climate yeah. as well. So, so that's I, really I like to add here, generally the wind simulation, there is a, a, a plugin called Butterfly. So you do that particle simulation in Butterfly as well. Uh, I think uh, you must have yeah. used that. Yes. Uh, yes. Then uh, somebody has asked whether the uh, steel buildings are cheaper steel buildings are never cheaper. That is what is my conclusion. Anybody, uh, both of you uh, uh, contractor architects, can you please make steel building cheaper? Although it is efficient when it comes to speed and uh, the space saving features of steel, uh, it is more efficient than RCC, but can you make steel building cheaper? Uh, if the material cost reduce further, it will definitely be cheaper. <laughs> no, that is not the right answer. <laughs> Currently, no. But then uh, I, I would certainly like to add here, uh, the parametric doesn't include the uh, increase the cost. Because generally what happens, we used to do prototypes and then we used to use them repetitively. So one prototype and 100 copies of it and we used to do that. Now in parametric, we use 1000 prototypes and one copy each. And because it is done by machinery, I think the cost is almost same. There is hardly any difference because of parametric in terms of material, labor handling. Absolutely, there is hardly any difference. So when we see steel buildings and when we see parametric steel buildings, I think the costing is almost same. Uh, I would because. Huh. I'm sorry, uh, I was wanting to say something. See, essentially, I think uh, uh, the way cost can come down uh, is it, not really a project question. It's, it's more um, uh, the entire construction culture, if you like. I had said this on a talk earlier on SSMB that, uh, uh, you know, we need to do more of this as more and more steel buildings uh, are going to come up. The consumption of steel for construction for uh, a primary structural element uh, goes up. I think eventually, uh, right now, steel has a novelty value. Okay. So even fabrication, a lot of those aspects, uh, uh, you know, which are mundane in a concrete building are, are deemed special or speciality or specialized for a steel building. So it's it's more a matter of uh, uh, doing more. So one of the questions I wanted to ask is, what is a mistake I have done as an architect uh, is probably not explore steel earlier, okay? And not do it more. That is a mistake. We, we ourselves treat steel as novelty. And I, we leave it for the creme de la creme clients. We leave it for people who we think intellectually understand steel crap. We just have to say, let's use steel as, you know, uh, as a regular building material, do more of it. There's a whole industry. It has to be an entire industry that is going to uh, factor a cost, uh, uh, you know, uh, appropriation for this. And it's not really just the raw material cost. And raw material cost, as Sapnil said, will drop down uh, based on consumption. So, it well, I was just joking. Uh, <laughs> I was just joking. Uh, but the, another important factor is, uh, if I would like to if I can just interrupt, is that uh, the, this particular question could be dealt with at the design phase itself. What happens is that when we are dealing with parametric structures, we, we take our liberties to, you know, to make highly curved, 3D curved structures and all. Although the material costs are basic, when it comes to processing such uh, uh, members for that precise geometry, that those costs also increase. So it is really important to uh, figure the balance between both the, both these things you know uh, how through design you can mitigate the cost that's yeah that's but important. i think uh, Swapnil, one of the major concerns here is that when we talk about parametric design and some of the things that we've been trying to talk to people about it's not necessarily the form usually is the consequence of the thing right so we also make sure that most of the projects where we do facades we make sure that the balance in the 3d forms and the 2d and the cost of fabrication is something that is always kept as a table along with all True. the other numbers. True. So the moment we factor that in, in our uh, grasshopper definition itself, it becomes like a byproduct. So the form is always a culmination of the two. So that becomes easier. There is one, there is one uh, very interesting question. What is the impact of uh, environmental impact of uh, on steel versus traditional building? Uh, open for, actually, Suraksha, you are the right person. Yeah. Yes. So actually, I was just going to say that, you know, steel is extremely 
uh, recyclable, meaning we can use all of this, recycle it and bring it back in a new form. It's just a production methodology of steel, which is highly energy and intensive and gives it, makes it that expensive and gives it a bad rap. I think the, the manufacturing process and the life cycle, that's something I think uh, from begin to end, we can actually work on the supply chain and see how to, you know, reduce that. Uh, that's, I think we're not yet there, but we need to, to get there. But in, we, in many of our buildings, we do a green building certification of all uh, kinds lead and IGBC and all of that, you know, steel, using steel has definitely um, uh, been something that's uh, uh, helped us. Uh, but um, environmentally, uh, I, I think, yeah, customization, mass customization is an issue for sure, which is something we need to take care of at the production end. Okay, Avnit, uh, do we have more time for at least one or two questions? Yes, we have five minutes. Uh, to okay, so this is very, very important question. Uh, so you all are successful first generation architectural firms uh, and the passion of creativity and innovation is visible in your work. So I can uh, see we all are driven by uh, one passion. So, uh, so what is your advice to the techno savvy next generation architects? Now, uh, not all of uh, all of the architects uh, are tech savvy. So, but those who are actually uh, uh, you know uh, get uh, inspired by today's presentation, or maybe they are inspired by general uh, parametric and steel and all these new technologies. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first on this. Uh, that's something we were just speaking last night about uh, uh, in another forum. Um, I, I think technology is most welcome. That's the way to go uh, for the future. But for those young minds who are getting out there, uh, you have excellent um, softwares, you have simulation uh, uh, softwares, and you can practically dream up or, or you know construct anything. Uh, do not forget fundamentals. Now, I see a lot of uh, youngsters who join my practice uh, as trainees and as uh, uh, young architects that I see that there is a bit of a disconnect with uh, fundamentals of design, fundamentals of mathematics, fundamentals of understanding of space uh, and those sensibilities. Uh, technology is, is definitely an aid as long as your fundamentals are in place. So sorry, a bit cynical here, but then I found that there is a huge gap. You know, they, they know the how to you know imbibe and uh, use technology, but uh, hardcore architecture still is about how to build and uh, uh, the devil, as they say, is in the details. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Sujaya. Actually, the guys who work with us, and we predominantly have a young crowd with us, frankly. And uh, the first thing that we have to do is actually teach the basics of mathematics to somebody who's computing. So that's really surprising to us as well. Me and Kujbu have had so many conversations where we are talking about guys who can code, but when you talk about uh, ratios, they're not really clear on it. So fundamentals is extremely important. And the other thing that I would like to add on this point is being hands-on with something, actually work with materials all the time. So we make sure that everybody who comes in is always hands-on with something because simulating, great, but you have to know the material and to what extent it can be pushed. So learning that is also very important. I agree. In fact, in fact, steel and parametrics in uh, both the case, the combination, the mock-up is very, very important. Sure. And that actually teaches you the mistakes, what you're going to do in your building, you know? So uh, you all must, uh, we all uh, will agree to this, that uh, without mock-ups, you cannot execute good steel building, right? Uh, uh, Suraksha. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I think the same thing that Shija and uh, Sujay said that, uh, you know, everybody is just uh, all about software, but it really comes down to the understanding the basics and, you know, sort of um, uh, working with your hands. So I, uh, when I, the team that I work with, we're also very young and we try to, you know, kind of put them more on, you know, site work initially and uh, more on a basic drafting work rather than really get them into all of this. And we have a core team that only researches on green, uh, where we do the full certification side and all of that. And then another team, which is all of this. Um, so we are very specific about where we use it and how we use it. And I think that's what's important. They shouldn't lose the big picture. You, you want them to use softwares or not first? You, you all are saying that they should not use. 
<laughs> I'm saying they must use first. <laughs> they should, they should. For sure. <laughs> practice that doesn't use. <laughs> Whether you tell them to use or not, they're still going to go ahead and use it. <laughs> you as architects, we, we, we never agree our mistakes, you know. I, I asked you the previous questions. We said, <laughs> I didn't do any mistake, you know. And I did agree on one of them. The mistakes. And they, they get hanged to the softwares and they do the usual mistake. They forget the basics. I don't do it. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Sopnil. Uh, yes, that's a very interesting question, sir, because I face this question on a daily basis. Being in the academy, I teach at the Masters of Digital Architecture Department. So my advice to the uh, young crowd would be to not just uh, be completely dependent on any specific software. You, know? you should also get into coding. You should also get into machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, automation because those are the avenues that would come in future. For me, parametricism is, uh, is a cliche now. It's been all around the world since the past uh, three decades. It's just now that we are starting with it in India. But uh, it has been there all the time. Now the future lies in coding. So like engineers, even architects should get into coding so that their dependencies on specific softwares get reduced. And as Sija said, they understand mathematics and the logics behind it. So it's very important to understand coding because once they get their coding right, rest all the things could be worked out. And coding so, is pretty simple. They can start doing it from the school. Yes. Now, I, I, when I tell uh, in my uh, presentation to architects that one should know coding for architecture, people don't agree. How many That's of you agree with me? I agree. Oh, that you should yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. learn coding. It's, okay. it's now, so now a fundamental language, I think. It's going to be in the future also. It's like a fundamental language, like you know English and you know how to read drawings. Absolutely. Like so language. it should start from first year of architecture and they should actually teach coding uh, as a part of uh, our academics. Actually, uh, sir, they all nowadays they started from school, you know. So, so it's, a coding. it's very important that, that, that architects take coding. it. Ahead. So, please, that is different coding. The kind of coding what we do in our uh, softwares. Uh, Sija and Khushbi, the first time we made, we made for coding, you know? We made and, for coding. Uh, there's a slight difference between uh, graphical coding or visual coding and the actual coding. I'm, I'm trying to think exactly. no, about the actual but, coding. Yeah. We but actually so, made on the actual coding only, but then the he means to so, say that no, the context is Architecture different. is a very complicated subject. Right. We have got the history of architecture, we have got humanity. <laughs> all those subjects and we added uh, parametric into it now you added coding into it <laughs> okay so uh, with uh, yes, uh, yes and uh, uh, just one small point sir uh, and in yeah. fact coding is going to be much more easier in future we, we started off with a very really complex coding language then we had c, no, c sharp coding, and now yes. we have python so now uh, in, in a few years it would be just like talking to a computer and telling what you want to do so coding can yeah. go up to that so uh, in this pandemic time, I, I started to learn a new subject, uh, you know, virtual uh, graphics, you know, and oh, very good. I, I, I went into uh, Unreal Engine and I started doing <laughs> blueprints and then C sharp, <laughs> C++ pro programming into it. And it very took good, me sir. hardly one and a half uh, month. Exactly. So it's easy, I know. Yeah. Uh, one need to do it. Uh, with this, uh, I think uh, we come to the end of today's session. Uh, Avnit, over to you. Uh, Andrea, whoever is going to take over. Thank you so much, Viveki. Thanks a lot. It was a very interactive uh, and interesting discussion, I'll say. We, we explored all the areas. In fact, uh, starting from design to coding and experiences. So, superb, superb uh, presentations and panel discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank now, you so much, Abhi. Thank you very much. For uh, next week, we have equally interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we are going to talk about retractable roof in form of a real life case study from a project in USA. So we have a Cowboy Stadium presentation that will be taken up by Abhijit Shah, who is managing director of Walter P. Moore US. They have now their office in Pune in India. And also joining us from London will be Chi Bhatia, he is senior designer from HKS. And then we have a moderator for this session who is also an expert in stadium design, Puneet. Uh, he's also going to join us from London. So we have uh, quite an interesting presentation plan for next week. 
uh, which will be on retractable roof. So they are going to take us through options that they explored before finalizing the final design. So I invite all of you to join us. Uh, the link is saved uh, in the chat box for you. Also, if you feel there are some areas where we couldn't, uh, we couldn't, uh, you know, we are, we are we, some questions that we couldn't uh, answer today. So you can write us back on edit at mxbn.in. So we'll ensure that uh, we reply all your questions which are which we couldn't address. Today. So finally, ending today's uh, presentation. In fact, we also would like to tell you that we have come up with an interactive uh, magazine with checks but also the videos so in taking ticketing uh, taking it further probably you will see a lot of project case studies also will be presenting in video format so i am uh, requesting my team to share those links also so that is something exciting we are doing from at our end and all of you thank you so much for joining us today have a great day and for audience also, I hope this was a, a very knowledgeable session for each one of you. And we look forward to see you next week, same time, same day. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.